Thank you all for coming on your Easter break, soon to be Easter break. Um, I want to start this talk by telling you about a woman that I interviewed in the San Diego County Jail. Uh, let me call her Lisa. So Lisa was uh, a woman in her mid-40s. She was homeless, and she sold crack cocaine to support herself. She also was a low-level crack user, and this was her 10th or 12th or 14th arrest for possession of methamphetamine for sale. So I was part of a team that was interviewing her to find out kind of where her life went wrong and how we might intervene to help her and whether she was eligible to serve a jail sentence or could be uh, put into a rehabilitation program. So began this long clinical interview. When did you first start using marijuana? Age 13. When did you first start using meth? Age 13. Okay, what happened to your family when you were 13? And she said, oh, my mother was a meth user and she wants someone to party with. So she started smoking meth with me. And then she started crying. And she said, now when my mother calls me in prison and says I love you to me, I can't say it back to her. So breaking all appropriate clinical protocol, I said, I don't think you have to. Your mother did a terrible thing to you. And indeed, Lisa had been raped because of meth. She had prostituted herself to get meth. She had married a man who was a meth user who beat her once literally almost to death. She had two teenage children who she couldn't care for, who lived with relatives in the state far away. Right, so use of this drug had really ruined her life. But her mother introduced her to it. If you can think of the most powerful bond in your life, it's generally with her mother's. So how could a mother do such a thing to a daughter? And further, how could this daughter ever survive and be kind of a fully realized human being? But this case also leads to more general questions. Why are we ever nice to anybody? In fact, humans are a pretty well-behaved group much of the time. Right? So we have a group of people here. Some of you know each other, some don't. And most of you don't look stressed out to be around other strangers of your species. A couple guys in the back I'm not so sure about, but the rest of you look pretty good. <laughs> All right, So you know who you are. Uh, so how do we do that? How do we enclose ourselves in a small space with unrelated strangers and not have a big stress response? Right? If this was a room full of rodents, fur would be flying. Right? Rodents do not like to be around, by and large, other rodents, even of the same species. But we like living in big cities. Right? It's fun to go to London or Copenhagen or New York. Right? It's exciting, all these people around us. So how do we do that? And how do we modulate our behavior to fit that new social environment? So that's what I spent 10 years running experiments trying to find out. What's that inflection point? What's the switch in which Michael goes from being his wonderful, sweet, kind self to occasionally crazy, raving maniac driving down the freeway yelling at some guy who cut him off in traffic. So I think that inflection point is interesting. And as Michael suggested, we discovered a new, uh, not a new molecule, a brain molecule that has a, has a bunch of new uses that we've identified that seem to work as this inflection point. And I call this the moral molecule, oxytocin. And here I mean moral in the small m sense. So again, I have no philosophical or theological agenda at all. But moral, in terms of social behaviors, means positive social behaviors. So being trustworthy, being compassionate, being generous. So all those things I'll show you, we can study in the laboratory. And we can quantify how this brain chemical affects these so-called moral behaviors. Okay, so. Before I do that, I want to show you, I think, one of the more interesting experiments we've done as a way to illustrate how oxytocin works in terms of affecting our moral behaviors or social behaviors. So here's a video. Thank you. 
Okay, so this is a kind of a funny, crazy experiment we did, which was preceded by you know ten years worth of experiments in the lab. But I think it illustrates very nicely how this molecule works. So let me that was a little hard to hear, so let me kind of recreate the findings from that. Who's the center of the wedding solar system? The bride. She had the biggest increase in oxytocin. Then the bride's mother, then the groom's father, then the groom, then the family and the friends. So they're like planets are right around the sun, who is the bride. All right, so the amount of oxytocin released tells us about the strength of that connection to that person or to that ritual. So it's not a zero-one kind of variable. It's not like I release oxytocin and now I'm, you know, uh, whatever, loving over the whole world. It's a conditional mechanism. And in that conditionality tells me how I adapt to the social environment that I'm in. Does that make sense? So if it were a zero-one, if it was a sledgehammer, then it wouldn't be adaptive. Right? So this system, uh, as we'll see, is a system that the uh, brain has to be trained in some sense to release. I'll be clear about what I mean by that. Um, but at the same time, I can tell about the strength of connection by looking at the release of oxytocin. So as an example of that, we've run a couple small uh, sample size experiments on the use of social media. So if you're tweeting, please uh, you know, include my tweet handle on there so I can uh, make sure I see what you're tweeting. So we have people use social media in private. And you can do whatever you want. So you got blood draw. You came in and you use social media, get another blood draw. We assess how you're feeling and the change in your oxytocin in blood. And what we found is that people got nice, solid, double-digit increases in oxytocin even when they sent out social media. Except we ran this for a Korean TV station and because Koreans are crazy about internet. And uh, we had these producers and reporters in this experiment. And one of these producers was, I don't know, 22, 23 year old guy, and his oxytocin went up 150%, right, through the roof. So, you know, it takes two weeks to do the assays. I write the report to the Koreans. Here's what we found, and I said, look, I don't know what this guy was doing in social media, but my guess was he was either interacting with his girlfriend or his mother. It's a fundamentally strong relationship. They checked, he was posting to his girlfriend's Facebook page. Right, so, oxytocin can be thought of as a sort of an index for how engaged I am emotionally with somebody else. Okay. So before we did all these kind of field experiments, we ran lots of controlled laboratory experiments. And I have to tell you, I'm a complete skeptic when I ask people about their social, moral behaviors. Right? Because what are you going to say in my experiment? Do you give money to homeless people? Oh, of course I do. I'm a great person. Right? Who knows? I mean, no. What, I just don't believe retrospective reports of anything. So, because I'm a skeptic, we use tasks that essentially tempt people with virtue and vice by putting money on the table. 
So we give you a stack of money, or actually it's computerized money that turns into real money when you get, leave the experiment. So you have, you have an account with your secret number, your identity is masked, and you can do whatever you want with that money, and we give you some instructions on what to do. So here's an, here's an example of that. So I split the room in half. So people on my right, I'll, I, I'll endow you with 10 euros. People on the left have zero, and then you log into a computer, and you get matched with someone from the other side of the room. Okay, you don't know who that person is, you can't see them, you can't talk to them, you'll never know who they, they are, they won't know who you are. And here's the task. People with 10 euros, you're asked to propose a split of that money to the person, that one person you've been matched to. So propose an offer that split. Okay. Now the trick is, the computer sends that offer to the people on this side of the room, and they get to decide if I like that proposal or not. If I like it, they say accept, and now the experimenter pay the money to both of you, the experiment's over. But if they don't like the, the split, they can reject it. And then both people get zero. So think about that for a second. Okay, so people on the right, how much money would you propose to split? Anybody? Tip. Tip. The full thing. Yeah. Okay, you're going to keep zero. No, it's zero. It's a zero sum game. Somebody else, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> yes. Right. So the most common offer in Western countries is half. Right. It's the modal offer, and offers of half are always accepted in, in developed countries. In other countries, it's different, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Okay. So people on the left. If that, you know that person has 10 euros, they offer you one, do you accept or reject? Because it's just damn unfair, right? <laughs> These greedy bastards have a lot of money, they're going to share it with you, right? So, okay, so the standard economic model says one euro better than zero, why don't you accept? Right? But that's, this is an embedded social interaction. So we use those same kind of social interactions to actually assess, for example, if we can make you more generous. So it turns out that if I infuse synthetic oxytocin into these individuals, they become 80% more generous. Or if I have these individuals watch a sad movie that induces their brain to make oxytocin, they become substantially more generous. And not just to specific individuals, and you don't know who that person is, they'll give more money to charity, they'll do all kinds of things. So once you engage the system, all of a sudden, in a tangible, meaningful, replicatable, quantifiable way, you are engaging in virtuous behaviors. I turned you into a person who's using good theory of mind. I can sort of work out, gee, if that was me, I don't think I'd take offers under, so offers under 30% of the split are almost always rejected in Western countries. So two euro, no, three, okay, I'm not so happy with three, but I'd take it. Four, five, six, yeah, I'll take that. So I can do that cognitive process. But now suddenly I have some other process that says, even in this zero-sum setting, now I'm going to offer seven. I'm going to keep three and give you seven. And we assess people afterwards to say, well, you know, how, how much did you enjoy the experiment? I loved it. It was great. I made three euro, but I loved it. So they're not less happy than people who got the placebo who don't give more money. So it's not all about money. And they're cognitively intact. We do all these cognitive tests. They know what they're doing. Okay, so... How does this happen? What is, what's going on with this particular molecule? So first, a little bit of neuroscience. So oxytocin is uh, in a family of really ancient molecules that uh, are responsible for the hallmark of mammal behavior. The, the oxytocin only occurs in mammals, although it has precursors in fish and other uh, species. So what are the hallmarks of mammals? Live birth, care for offspring. And that's what oxytocin classically does. It contracts the uterus during birth, promotes uh, milk, let down for breastfeeding. And that was, they say, the knowledge. So when I first started thinking about oxytocin as this kind of molecule that would motivate positive social behaviors, I did what, you know, like you guys do. Kind of bounce it off your colleagues. I had this idea. I think I'm going to run this experiment. And one of my colleagues said, that was the world's stupidest idea. Because everybody knows oxytocin is just a female hormone, just for birth. I said, yeah, but in animals, it had been shown since the late 70s and 80s, that in particularly in group living animals and socially monogamous animals, that oxytocin seems to signal familiarity or safety. So I go in my burrow, 
I'm a little, you know, furry rodent, and I, oh, that's Michael. I recognize his smell. I let him affiliate with me. So now we can cuddle up in our little burrow and be warm and safe, right? And I smell Andreas, and I go, oh, I don't recognize him. He might be unsafe. And so I put my stress hormones on, and I'm going to attack him, right? So it's kind of this safety signal. But now in humans, I'm getting safety signals from total strangers who are interacting with me by computer, sending me money. How does that work? Like, what the heck can that mean? So I think it's a very interesting system. So it turns out that human beings uh, have a larger mass of oxygen receptors relative to other species, relative to the size of the brain, uh, particularly in the frontal cortex. And these frontal oxytocin receptors uh, essentially make us more sensitive to social relationships. And if we know anything about humans, we know that we're highly social creatures. And so the only reason, the only way we can be around this sort of sea of strangers in which we live is to have something in our heads that says, Michael, wonderful, Andreas, not. Right? Otherwise, I, I, I'm stressed out the entire time. I'm a rodent. I'm just worried about all the other humans around me. It doesn't have to be perfect, it just has to be good enough, right, evolutionarily. As long as it's good enough, then I can kind of figure out who to be around. And then once I can do that, what else do I have? I have civilization. I have people who live and work together who are unrelated. That's an amazing invention of the humans. That, you know, only animals that are bees and ants are very closely related, mall rats. Those are the only ones that can kind of build these agglomerations of large number of species. Right, well, we do it with people we're not closely related to. Right, so we have something in our heads. So secondly, because oxytocin is so evolutionarily old, it's one of the very few hormones that's released, I'm uh, sorry, synthesized in the brain and both released in the brain and the peripheral circulation. So, 60 seconds of neuroscience. Basal levels of oxytocin are highly fluctuating, close to zero but fluctuate, and basal Peripheral oxytocin in blood and brain oxytocin and cerebral spinal fluid are unrelated. But on stimulus, if I give you a stimulus that induces oxytocin release, synthesis happens within about a second, and I get a coordination of central and peripheral oxytocin. What's this mean? It means that I can look at the change in oxytocin in blood and get a reflection of the change in brain. So now I have a, an assay that tells me about what's going on in brain, which is what I really care about, presumably. So that's not true for almost any other hormone with just a couple exceptions, right? And in the brain, oxytocin works as a neuromodulator. It modifies brain activity by interacting with other neurochemicals and changing activity, particularly in the axon hillock. Okay, so if you're not a neuroscientist, just ignore what I said. All you need to know is I can measure it perfectly and get an idea of what's going on in the brain, right? Very unusual. Okay. All right, so... When we started doing these experiments, we did all kinds of different versions. Experiments where the money grows, experiments where the money shrinks, experiments where you can punish. And I had a, a, a graduate student named George who asked me, he's a psychologist, he asked me this really good question. What do you think the subjective experience is of your brain releasing oxytocin? So that's like a question we should understand. So he developed this uh, little video of this little boy named Ben. And Ben has, is two years old, his terminal brain cancer. And the video runs 100 seconds. And it's of Ben playing while his father talks to the camera, talking about how it feels to know his son is dying. So his son has been through chemo and radiation. They've reduced his tumor size, but they've done everything that he can do to extend his life, say six months, and then he's going to die. But Ben's happy because he's done with chemo. He finally feels good. He's not throwing up. And he's just a happy, lucky, happy-go-lucky kid. But the father, although trying to enjoy Ben, has this dread because he knows what's going to happen. And Ben doesn't. So I'm not going to show you this video. Uh, the last time I showed it was at a law conference at UCLA. And after I showed it, several lawyers actually cried. And you guys know that lawyers don't have souls, right? So <laughs> you nice people definitely cry, so I'm not going to show it. But here's the experiment. You come in. You get a blood draw. You watch this 100-second video. You rate your different emotions that you're feeling on a 1 to 7 scale. Do you feel distressed, happy, sad? Okay, and then you do another blood draw, and then you do so you share the money tasks like we just did in the room. And the control group watched the same father and son at the zoo. Runs 100 seconds, 
They don't talk about cancer or death. They do call him Miracle Boy. He's bald. You're not really sure why. Okay, and so we compared oxytocin release and behavior in those two circumstances. What we found is that the change in oxytocin positively correlated with people's subjective experience of empathy. In other words, the more oxytocin you released, the more empathic you felt towards Ben and his father. And the more empathic you felt, the more money you share with a stranger. And the more money you donated to childhood cancer charities. So this molecule not only connects us dyadically to people around us, it actually works at a distance, which is actually pretty amazing. And again, we can replicate that directly by infusing oxytocin into the brain safely through the nose, not have you watch the video, give you the same physiological response across individuals, and say, do you want to share more money? Yes. Do you want to donate to childhood cancer? Yes, at a greater rate. Okay, so for the scientists in the room, I think two important parts of these experiments. One is, the first half is to show, are there tasks besides birth, reproduction, uh, breastfeeding, all of which are too messy to run in my lab, don't want to get involved in those things. Are there other stimuli that induce oxytocin release? If so, does that generate some positive social behavior? And then, if I intervene in the oxytocin system, if I shoot synthetic oxytocin into your brain, can I replicate that behavior? Right, you need both. Right, so there are many studies now which infuse oxytocin to humans, and all of a sudden they're doing this, that, and the other thing, which is not surprising. I've given you a drug. What I really want to know is the full circle. What happens in the brain naturally? And to make sure, because all these systems are highly inter, inter, uh, interdependent and uh, nonlinear, can I actually replicate that if I intervene in a single way by changing oxytocin? Right? And then we have this complete picture. We have a causal relationship, and we know the brain's doing this naturally. And that's what we found. And so, again, doing you know varieties of these experiments. I'll show you some other videos in a minute. Doing a variety of these experiments, we found over and over and over that although oxytocin is adaptive, right, I'm not releasing a thousand percent, I'm releasing a little bit for you, a little bit more for my best friend, a lot more for my mom, right, so it depends on that relationship. It's an index of the underlying connection between individuals. But I think the kind of big news here is that we, we were missing that big target, right, so, you know, scientifically we know a lot about fear and aggression, all these kind of negative social behaviors, we didn't have a really good target to ask, gee, why would I ever engage in positive social behaviors? And in fact, those positive social behaviors are so common that we sometimes forget about them. So to do that, again, we had a nice big fat target oxytocin, which we can measure and manipulate. That's really nice. And we designed these sharing the money kinds of tasks to quantify the relationship between oxytocin and these positive social behaviors we call moral behaviors. Okay, so that's the research program. So where the rubber hits the road now is why isn't everybody nice if most people presumably release oxytocin? Why do we have evil behavior in the world? Uh, what about criminals? Uh, you know, how does the system break down? So I'm going to get to that in just a minute. Those are very important questions, and we've spent a lot of time thinking about those. Okay. So, but just to summarize, why do people behave in moral ways? Okay, so answer one, because God's watching us. Might be true. I don't know. I can't test that scientifically, so I'm going to let that one go. Fine. Uh, could be the government's watching us. Right? So we have the sense that, you know, if I do something bad, I'll get caught eventually. And so I, you know, there are cops, there are courts, you know, uh, something will happen bad to me. Or, it could be that we're watching us. Right? As social creatures, we're very attuned to people's behaviors. So let's suppose to my dear, dear friend Michael, I do something really bad. Right? Take his, his uh, iPad. Right? Now it's mine. I'm going to take it with me. What would he do? Well, first of all, he'd try to get it back from me. But then he would tell everybody I know, and we know a million people in common, that, that guy's a thief. Stay away from him. Don't be around him. And now I'm ostracized. And as a social creature, it's not adaptive for me to be ostracized from my group. So think about how we punish prisoners in jail who misbehave. Right? You put them in solitary confinement. Because very psychologically and physiologically stressful for social creatures. 
people in solitaire begin to hallucinate very rapidly. They want to, they want to be around the humans. Right? So it's stressful for us to be isolated. So I don't want to do, engage in those behaviors. So I'm modulating my behavior all the time. So if Michael comes and wants to fight with me, I'm happy to fight with him too, and we'll get to that behavior in a minute, which is interesting. But if he wants to be nice to me, and I release oxytocin, I'm nice back to him. So what is oxytocin? It's essentially the underlying neurochemical basis for the golden rule. You're nice to me, I'll be nice to you. So in every experiment we run, it's the receipt of a positive social signal that induces in the receiver the release of oxytocin, and then that oxytocin release predicts how much I'll reciprocate with him. Right? Again, if he wants to play bad, I can play bad. But if he wants to play nice, in general, I'll release oxytocin for 95% of the thousands of people we've taken blood from now in 12 years. 95% release oxytocin, and they'll reciprocate in kind. Right? That's pretty amazing. And guess what? The golden rule exists in every culture on the planet. Everyone. Why? It must resonate with our human nature. Okay, so... That story I just told you and, uh, was also developed by this guy in the bottom of the screen, Adam Smith. Adam Smith, I remember that guy. Didn't he write some book in economics? Yeah, the Wealth of Nations. Turns out that Adam Smith was not, although he's called the father of economics, was not an economist. He was a moral philosopher. And uh, 17 years before he wrote the, wrote the Wealth of Nations, he wrote a book called The Theory of Moral Sentiments in 1759. And in this book, he essentially laid out the same theory, absent any evidence, of course, the same theory for human moral behaviors. There's a theory of moral sentiments. And what's that sentiment? We would call that empathy. My sense of connection to Michael, right? He called it, he, that word's a new coinage. He called it fellow feeling. If I have fellow feeling, then if Michael, I do something that hurts Michael, I share that pain. And I don't like pain, so I tend to avoid doing those things. If I do something that brings Michael joy, I get to share in that joy as well. I like joy. I like to be happy. So he said this presumed brain system, our words, not his, is what modulates moral behaviors. So when this book came out in 1759, Adam Smith was a very weird guy. He lived with his mother until uh, she died. Sometimes leave the house in his pajamas and walk around the forest talking to himself. This guy was a total rock star in 18th century Europe. He's having dinner with the King of France. He's hanging out with Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin. He's on the map. Why? Because he developed the first full terrestrial theory of morality. Terrestrial meaning it didn't rely on God intervening in some way. But it said, look, if you're a social creature like humans are, you must have some kind of innate mechanism in which we're modulating our behavior. So I don't necessarily need God or government telling me what to do because I'm getting feedback from all the other humans all the time. So I, didn't, I said not necessarily. We might need a little God and a little government because we found it in experiments that these moral intuitions will sometimes fail in the extremes. So if I'm tired of my wife, she's driving me crazy, and I think, maybe I'll just kill my wife. It's nice to have society say, or the Bible say, they say, no, can't do that. No, that's just wrong. Divorce her, that's, that's all right. Killing her? No, can't do it. Right? Just, in, just in case I was thinking about that. Right. So that's what I think society does, and that's why I think some of the great books in philosophy and theology give us these nice bright lines. Right? This stuff's okay, and within this range, you're on your own. You can, you know, your moral intuitions work pretty well. Out here, maybe a little guidance is needed, just in case you're really stressed out, wigged out, worried, angry, upset. You might want to know, actually, you know, what the rules are. All right, so having said all this, I want to provide a couple cautionary notes. And here's one from a uh, TV show from the U.S.
Okay, so if you look at the vents, we're now misting you with oxytocin. I'll be collecting your wallet soon, so please have them ready. No, so the way to increase moral behaviors in the world is not to be spraying people with oxytocin, right? So that's not what this work says. It's to really understand how the system works, and that's what I'll spend the second half of this talk talking about, is how does this brain system work that modulates up or down oxytocin release? Okay, so the funny part of this story, first of all, the funny part is, apparently, TV writers read the journals. I mean, that's kind of cool, right? So be careful what you write in the journals. They may get picked up by TV shows. The second is, so we had three kind of three big publications come out in 2005. The blood work, the oxygen inhaler work, and some work on distrust I'll tell you about in a minute. So all this work kind of pops out, and you get these kind of funny phone calls. You know, the media call you up and you're doing some interview on the phone. So I'm taking my kids to school and answering phone calls. And then these people call, hey, we just spoke to you. Can you come to New York today? I live in California. That's a, kind of a long plane ride. And I said, hey, who is this? Good morning, America. Oh, uh, well, I kind of had plans tomorrow. They're thinking, what's wrong with me? They want to put me on TV. Of course. Like, I, can't, I guess I can go. So I call my wife. Hey, honey, I, I guess I'm going to New York today. I, I don't know why. So anyway, do all these morning shows. And oh, and, and they love the inhaler stuff. Because it's, you know, it's, the, it's, the, it's the free lunch approach. You don't have to be a good person. You don't have to work at being a nice human. You know, just give me the drug. All right. And this, I should say, so it's a prescription drug. We have, uh, now we have FDA approval to actually do this in the U.S. So our first study actually was done in Switzerland because we, the United States Federal Drug Administration would not allow us to do this study in the United States for very stupid regulatory reasons. Now we have permission and we've done, you know, I've put probably 1,000 people on oxytocin with zero adverse effects. We haven't had one person say, I got a headache, I got a tummy ache, okay. So very, very safe. Drug's been around for 60 years. It's as safe as it gets. But what happens? So we run this study. Everyone loves the inhaler. Now you're on TV. Everyone hears about it, including the TV writers. And inevitably, three months later, on the internet becomes a product called Liquid Trust. Citing all my research, all the TV stuff, right? and true testimonials. Girls love me. My boss gave me a raise. You know, so, okay. so anyway, a friend of mine said to me, it's ethyl alcohol. So it's, it's, it's 50 bucks for two bottles of ethyl alcohol because it's homeopathic. So please don't go buy Liquid Trust on the internet. Um, other little code to that story is, I don't know, after maybe a year or so, you know, 2007 or something, this is all out. And some TV show in New York, again, wants to have the representatives from the Liquid Trust people on the show. And they want me to be on the show to rebut whatever this person says. And I think, you know, not a good use of my time. Like, I fly all the way to New York to be on TV for 15 minutes for some, and then I thought, well, who else can defend this work, right, but me? So, okay, so I go to New York. Very surreal experience. So they hired this PhD like two weeks before, the Liquid Trust people. Beautiful, looks like a, I call it spokesmodel, right? She's like too, too pretty to believe. Right, so she goes first, blah, 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 blah. Oh, everyone loves it, it's great. And then I have my you know, three minute spot and I'm prepared. I'm gonna talk to the camera, I've got an audience, I'm gonna go. So I said, let me tell you why everything this woman said is bogus. It's a prescription drug. You can't miss it in the air. We put two teaspoons of liquid up your nose to get an effect, right? Because most of it goes down your throat. Pack the sinuses. It takes an hour to get into the brain. It can't be spritzing it on your nose. It has no effect, right? You need a big dose to have an effect. All right. Blah, blah, blah. My students at my lab tape it. Because it's kind of fun to see, you know, the lab director on TV. So, you know, I was so focused on the camera. When I look at the tape, this woman has put her head on my shoulder while I'm talking. I don't even know it. Completely inappropriate. <laughs> I mean, just, okay, so it's, it's, uh, it's not about drugs, it's about something else that we'll talk about. All right, so uh, based on the animal work, uh, fMRI work, our lab and other work has done, uh, other labs have done, uh, we've kind of mapped out what I call the home circuit. Home stands for human oxytocin mediated empathy circuit. So oxytocin is produced in the hypothalamus. There are separate nuclei that produce oxytocin that's really centrally and peripherally. But as I said, under stimulus, those uh, uh, neurons synthesize the release of oxytocin. This projects all over the brain, but primarily to regions in the temporal cortex uh, and in the frontal cortex. In particular, this area uh, in the cingulate, in the, called the subgenual cortex area, those oxytocin receptors appear to modulate midbrain dopamine release. What does that mean in human talk? It means that we have a feedback loop in the brain so that it feels good to do good. Right? So 
I see my dear friend Michael. Michael, how are you, my dear friend? Oh, look, he's smiling. Oh, my brain says, apparently the humans like that. You should probably be nice to the humans some more because they're smiling and they're shaking your hands. They're very friendly. And then I go to my enemy, enemy Andreas, and I beat him up, and he's very angry with me. And then my brain goes, oh, apparently the humans don't like to be hit. You don't walk by and hit them in the face. They don't care th for that so much. So I'm modulating my behavior. Okay? If I'm on a sports field and the competitor gets me, hi, how are you? As opposed to, you know, whatever, playing sports, whatever that, you know, football, whatever it is, then not appropriate. So I, I can modulate my behavior. Mr. Testosterone to men, uh, testosterone tends to inhibit the uptake of oxytocin. It's oxytocin antagonist. So in experiments where I give testosterone to males and compare their behavior on testosterone to themselves on placebo within subject's design, we find testosterone-enhanced males are more selfish and more entitled. So in that task that we just did, they offer less when they make the first decision, and we ask them, how much do you demand from others? They demand more. Okay, so who are the most selfish, entitled people on the planet? Teenage boys, which half of us used to be. We will tell you that. And I can tell you a good evolutionary story on why, if you're a teenage boy, you should engage in those behaviors that are very self-serving. Aggression, risk-taking. You can tell a nice evolutionary story, and actually there's a good neurologic story as well. It's not surprising that most soldiers are young males. In fact, we've shown that in these kind of share the money tasks where if you transfer money, it grows in size, that, which is a way to kind of measure trust. I'm going to give up my money, but I'm going to make you a lot better off, and then you may share some back with me or not. That the more distrusted a man is, that is, the less money he's sent, the more his testosterone goes up and the less money he'll return. So women don't seem to have this effect. In fact, in every experiment we've run, uh, so, let me go back to men. So, that sounds like a bad thing, but essentially males absorbing the cost of punishing people who don't cooperate. So, in lots of studies, lots of different labs, uh, it's been shown that men have a much more uh, kind of personal response to being distrusted, non-cooperative, treated badly. We have this aggressive response. We have a testosterone response. Uh, and so, it's males that want to enforce the rules. Damn it. We enforce the rules. Conversely, in every experiment we run in 12 years, every experiment, women release more oxytocin after stimulus than men do. And they're subsequently more trustworthy, more generous, more compassionate. So now we know why women are nicer than men, oxytocin. Except, it turns out that oxytocin uptake varies over the menstrual cycle. So women are usually nicer than men, except when they're ovulating and then they're not so nice. Ladies, you know who you are. You cry at movies when you're ovulating a little more, maybe. Okay, so it turns out that estrogens make women more sensitive to oxytocin. Progesterones inhibit oxytocin uptake. So women get two spikes of estrogen over the menstrual cycle, and so there are times when women are going to be more sensitive to these positive or negative social cues where men are going to be, you know, the level's lower, and uh, they'll just be flat most of the time. Okay, so women, you guys are nicer than we are, but you're complicated. We like that about you. We're happy that you're complicated. Keeps us guessing. <laughs> All right, so it turns out in uh, animal models that animals that are abused or neglected early in life don't develop uh, a large number of oxytocin receptors, particularly in the forebrain, this, these areas that modulate the dopamine release. And so we decided to test this in humans. We did that by looking at a sample of women who as children had been repeatedly sexually abused. So very severe abuse cases. And we compared those to college-age women who had just a little bit of abuse, although all abuse is bad, I think we can agree, who had much less abuse or no abuse at all. But we found in the severely abused case, about half those women did not release any oxytocin stimulus. And all of them had very impaired social behaviors, difficulty sustaining relationships. Um, in the book, we, we talked about this. And we did lots of work on this. We genotyped them. We imaged their brains. We measured oxytocin release. So there's several ways of this study. And one woman in our sample who was, uh, I think, 21 years old um, actually committed suicide between uh, waves of the study. Uh, so, you know, abuse is very, very severe. 
and it may induce permanent brain damage in which, uh, just like the visual system needs visual input to develop properly in the brain, if you're not getting nurturing, you're not developing the nurturing system, the care connection system. Okay, so I think more work needs to be done on this, but I think the early evidence is uh, quite worrisome. Having said that, for the people in the mild sexual abuse group, uh, we found robust oxytocin release across all these women. So at least like it, it really needs severe abuse before the system really starts to shut down. And indeed, the degree of abuse did not predict their oxytocin release. So some people had really, really terrible abuse histories and still released oxytocin, had some appropriate social behaviors, and others had more moderate abuse but didn't release oxytocin at all. And so there, we're looking now at some genes associated with serotonin that may be associated with resilience to, um, to abuse. And lastly, I should say that I, I mentioned this 5% that don't release oxytocin in our experiments. Very consistent across all the samples we've done. So of that 5%, about half those are just stressed out people. They're having a really bad day for whatever reason. The other half are very unusual. So from this lecture so far, you've already realized I'm a brilliant scientist. Yes, thank you. Not true at all. I have no idea what I'm doing. Except it turns out that subjects will tell you what you should be studying. So we did an experiment early on where we draw blood. We're vampires. Where we had to stick a guy four times to get a vein. Turns out that people don't like to be stuck four times. So after we got the blood, I was really nice. I thanked him. And I said, oh, thank you so much. You really suffered for science. This is great. And he said, I love this experiment. Can I come back tomorrow? What? So again, his identity is masked. But I have this tube of blood, which has a secret number on there. So just being a little anal retentive, I go and check the output data for that ID number, and I find out that he was someone who was in a task in which you can give up your money and make the money grow in someone else's account, and that person can either share the money back with you or not. So it's a measure of trust. He had been shown maximal trust. He had 40 bucks in his account. The other person who trusted him had kept zero of their money, and they were expecting something back from him. He kept every penny. <laughs> so technically, we call these guys, sorry, we call these guys, uh, uh, unconditional non-reciprocators, they never reciprocate. What do we really call them in my lab? We call them bastards. <laughs> Not nice people to be around. Okay, and what do we find? We find no markers at all for where these people come from, other than their oxytocin is highly dysregulated, suggesting uh, oxytocin receptor dysfunction, and they look like psychopaths psychologically. So we just got back from a study in Wisconsin where we took blood from 161 diagnosed psychopaths. Mostly are sex offenders, some are violent, some nonviolent. And guess what? No oxytocin release. And that Cancer Kid video, it's a sledgehammer. It's so reliable, they watched it, nothing. Even for the pedophiles, which is half of our sample, they don't get an oxytocin release when they see that little dying kid. The system is just shut down. So what's the hallmark of psychopathology? Well, one of the hallmarks, lack of empathy. There's oxytocin. So why are we moral creatures? Why are we nice to people? Because we share emotions with others. We do that partially through the release of oxytocin. All right. Does this have any impact outside the lab? It has a lot of impact, and I hope we'll have a chance with our discussants to talk about that after the break. One of those has to do with this gentleman on the right, his name is Hans Reiser. He is an internet entrepreneur in the Silicon Valley in California. He was kind of a rising star in the, uh, in the mid to late 90s. Started a bunch of companies, made a bunch of money, and married this nice woman on the right from Russia. Had a little child, uh, living in a fancy house. And after some number of years, she decides she wants to divorce him. California means she's going to get half of his money. What does he decide to do? He doesn't want the divorce. Instead, he decides to kill her and dump her body, which is never found. You guys, it's always the spouse, right? Don't kill your spouse. It's always you. Okay, so they never find the body, but it's very clear it's him. He goes to trial. On the last day of trial, he, everyone agrees he's going to be found guilty, and in California, we had a death penalty. So he'll be found guilty with so-called special circumstances, which means he can be put to death. His lawyer suggests he pleads guilty to avoid the death penalty. And the deal is, if he pleads guilty, they won't give him the death penalty, but he has to show them where he dumped the body, which he does. So they recover the body. This woman gets buried. He's in jail for life in San Quentin. 
but he's not a stupid guy. He's a smart guy. He's a psychopath. He apparently also reads the journals. And after a year in prison, he writes a four-page handwritten appeal to the state of California requesting a new trial, claiming, among other things, that his lawyer had what I call oxytocin deficit disorder, ODD. He's odd because he doesn't release oxytocin and feel empathy. Now think about that. His lawyer couldn't, couldn't properly represent him because his lawyer was a psychopath. <laughs> Insane. Right? Okay, so luckily, State of California throws away the, the appeal. I don't get paid to be an expert witness. Boo-hoo for me. This has real consequence. What if I do murder my wife and I say, hey, my oxytocin made me do it. I just don't make oxytocin. I'm very deficient. I can't help it. And by the way, my testosterone is super high too, so I'm a real bastard. Is that a good defense? I don't know. You know what the oldest uh, murder defense is? Is sleepwalking. In, uh, in British uh, common law, it's been used many times. In the U.S., it's been used uh, maybe half a dozen times. Almost never works. Rarely does it work. I was sleeping. I stabbed my wife 400 times. Okay. All right. So, but I think that's worth talking about. What about this notion of responsibility? What if I just don't feel it? I have a sense of empathy. Or I was really stressed out. Actually, we have, at least in the U.S., we actually have that stressed out response. It was a crime of passion. And so I'm not punished as much as if I planned out this murder or planned out this crime. It was a crime of passion. I was stressed out. In the moment, I killed her. I'm sorry. Okay, so it's called diminished capacity. Okay, so I'm going to finish up by showing you a couple of videos of some of the more uh, interesting experiments we've done in the field. So we ran all these laboratory experiments, and we started thinking, hey, these share the money tasks in which you're anonymous are really not, not really ecologically valid. They're not what we do in our daily lives. We interact with people face to face. We get to know people. We get information from them. Uh, we smell them. Lots of oxytocin receptors in the olfactory bulb. So I'm smelling Michael. I recognize him. All right. Uh, so as I started writing the book, I thought, you know, I have to sort of be honest about why I did spent 10 years of my life doing this research. So I already gave you the dishonest answer. In fact, there's also an economic answer, which I'll tell you in a minute, about how this affects economies, uh, how trust affects economies. But as I started writing the book, I realized that the honest answer to why I spent 10 years of my life looking for a moral molecule had to do with this woman, the nun in the corner. Her name is Sister Mary Maristella. And after she stopped being a nun in the 1950s, she later became my mother. And so I was raised Catholic, and I was an altar boy, and I learned how to say things in Latin and carry a cross and breathe in incense, and would ask mom, hey, what about the Buddhists? Do Buddhists get to go to heaven? Oh. What about the Protestants? Oh, God forbid the Protestants should get into heaven. <laughs> Right? So after a while, I really rejected that. I thought, you know, I see people who are good and bad, or at least engaging in good and bad behaviors all the time. It doesn't seem to skew by what religion you believe in or what book you read. Or... So I think I was really searching for another reason for positive and negative social behaviors, what we might call moral and immoral behaviors. And uh, so in these experiments, I sort of assiduously avoided digging into people's religions. I didn't want to know. I just didn't want to go there, right? We asked people, do you believe in God? Do you go to church? But, you know, none of that mattered. Once you release oxytocin, that was the, the big explanatory factor. But then I started thinking, you know, if I stay in the lab with college students who are generally not very religious anyway, I can't really take on this religion oxytocin interactive effect. And so I call this the weenie alert. Like, weenie alert, weenie alert, you're wasn't out on studying something that could be potentially be important. So now, with permission, we've actually gone to churches and taken blood before and after religious rituals. We've gone to folk dances where people, many uh, ancient and even current religious rituals involve movement, coordinated movements. So in these rituals, we found, indeed, that a majority of individuals released oxytocin during the ritual. And those who released oxytocin reported feeling closer to their communities. Although, interestingly, oxytocin release did not predict people's feeling of closeness to God or some ultimate reality. But the rituals are sticky because they help us build community, and that's what we want as human beings, is community. So I don't think the rituals are going away. All right. The other thing that, that bothered me a lot was 
what about studies outside the U.S.? So every study I've talked to you, talk, told you about so far had been done in the U.S. or Western Europe. But that's not most of the world. So I started thinking, gee, what's the furthest away I can get from the developed world? And the furthest away I could get was the rainforest of Papua New Guinea. So I ran a study following a ritual, and I'll show you some film in a minute, of what it looks like for people in Papua New Guinea. So if this mechanism is universal, and I've sort of implied to you that it is, I should find it in this group of people too. <coughs> this isn't Japanese. Is that with a Japanese film crew? So this is a Japanese uh, documentary on human evolution, and one of those was on uh, social, evolution of social behavior. So this is my village, uh, called Malke Village. A thousand people live in this village. And this is uh, their, uh, not how they dress normally. They normally wear kind of used clothes. This is the dance they have done for, their ancestors have done for hundreds or even thousands of years. And it's uh, kind of a tribal war dance. And so what I did is I came in. There's no electricity, no running water, no services at all. Brought in a generator, centrifuges, uh, liquid nitrogen, all kinds of tubes. And with this expression in uh, English, FUBAR, uh, you, if you don't know the acronym, you can look it up later. This is a FUBAR experiment. Basically, everything that could go wrong did go wrong other than someone getting killed. So I got embedded in this village for a week with nothing to do. So we set up this little medical tent and uh, basically took oxytocin before and after. So none of these, this is all men, 20 men. None of them had ever been to a doctor or dentist before. They had never seen their blood drawn, although they certainly had seen blood. Um, and so this is what we did. We had them do their dance. We took their blood before and after and measured what went on. And um, these guys are pretty healthy. Infant mortality is the highest uh, cause of death. About 20% of children die uh, as infants. And otherwise, they can live into their 70s. They're vegetarians, primarily. Eat very little meat. And what do we find? Just like in our rituals in the Western world, we found the majority of these individuals release oxytocin after this ritual stimulus. And those who release oxytocin said they felt closer to their communities. They felt more connected to their communities, and even in this case, their ancestors. Okay, so it seems to work more or less everywhere, as far as we can tell. Okay. All right, so I'm going to show you one more video. Uh, we also worried about these experiments on trusting other people with your resources. You know, you want to run, you know, 100, 120, 130 people, put 40 bucks on the line. You know, that, I can afford that. But what about stakes where we trust literally our lives to other people? What about eating in restaurants? I don't know who's making my food. Why am I eating this food? How about getting on an airplane? Are these pilots drunk? Are they trained? How do I know? But we do it all the time. So, in fact, I've got to fly tomorrow to Italy. Who knows what the Italians are doing on the airplane? I have no idea. So we thought of an experiment in which we could test re literally trusting your life to a stranger. So in many of these experiments, I always put myself through the experiment first, because I think if I'm not willing to do it, why should any other people do it if I'm not willing to do it? So it turns out, as we started thinking about these experiments, I thought, well, what, you know, what can I do that really trusts my life to a stranger? I have a fear of heights, which I think is an appropriate thing to have for all the humans. Sorry. I have a fear of heights. So the thing I don't like is to be way, way, way up and looking down. So here's the experiment we thought of. My first time skydiving. Take my blood before and after and see what the heck happens. Anybody skydived before? Insane, crazy, weird thing to do. So I strap myself. Actually, this guy's Danish. Kenneth. I still know his name. <laughs> Okay, so what do we find? Stress hormones up 400%, no surprise. Testosterone up 80%. Oxytocin up 22%. Let me tell you, when you free fall 7,500 feet in 50 seconds and you pull that parachute, it, you know, it's 120 miles an hour. You can't talk. It's very noisy. What was the first thing out of my mouth when I pulled that parachute? I love you, Kenneth! <laughs> Literally. I mean, you feel so happy that you're alive. 
and that's oxytocin. I trusted my life to this guy, and I survived. All right, so here's a takeaway. There's good evidence in animals, and now a little emerging evidence in humans that this uh, oxytocin release makes us feel empathy. That leads to moral behaviors, including things like trust. And I had shown in my work as an economist that trust strongly predicts whether the countries will be prosperous or not. And what happens when you raise prosperity? You reduce the number of people in poverty, which is a stressor, which can inhibit oxytocin release, which can provide a virtuous cycle. So it says that you actually can design institutions, potentially, to promote greater prosperity, greater happiness. How does that happen? I mean, if this were true, I should find some cross-country evidence for it. In fact, if I look at tolerance, this is for tolerance for people who are different than you, nice income gradient. If I look at trust, there's a nice income gradient. If I look at happiness, right, Denmark's near the top of that list, nice income gradient. So it's not income that makes me happy. It's what income gives me, which is the, the uh, relief of stress, of survival, and the ability to connect to others, to be empathic. And indeed, we've actually found this in our experiments in which individuals who release the most oxytocin when they're trusted are, in fact, happier in their lives. And why are they happier? They have better romantic relationships. They have more uh, close relationships with their families. families. They have more close friends, and they share more money with a stranger in our task in the lab. So at every level, they're connecting better to the people around them. Okay, so I want to conclude by telling you what happened to Lisa, the prisoner I interviewed in the jail. So after we interviewed her, she was indeed eligible to spend a year and a half in a lockdown rehab facility in which she got therapy to work on her addictions. Uh, her goal was to finish that program and move out of San Diego, where she'd been really sucked into this drug culture, and move to the middle of the country, to the city that her children lived in with her aunt and uncle. And she indeed did that. She rented this kind of crappy apartment, and she was trying to rebuild her relationship with her children. The last we heard from her, she had not contacted her mother. So I think the take home here is that there's a variety of ways that we can raise oxytocin. One of the early ways we found was the role of touch. So we found that touch releases oxytocin. So as an experiment on myself, I decided that I would not shake hands with people, I would instead start hugging people. And I found that people really started connecting to me a lot. And so the students in my lab gave me this nickname, Dr. Love, oxytocin, the love molecule. Oh, that's funny. Until I had a reporter come out who <laughs> outed me in Fast Company magazine as Dr. Love. So at first I was kind of unhappy. I'm like, hey, I'm a serious guy. You know, I'm doing real science here, and I can't have a funny nickname. Then I thought, what better thing can I do in my life than encourage people to love each other? In a very real sense, our biology has motivated us to be loving creatures, to care about others. So you can use the L word with your friends and family today, love. It's just biology. It's nothing weird. And it certainly is quantifiable. So if you connect to the people around you, they'll connect back. Give them their gift of oxytocin. So your prescription from Dr. Love is eight hugs a day. Eight hugs a day means you're giving this gift to eight people while you're out of the house and you're starting this virtuous cycle in which we're building a nicer society, a happier society, and a more moral society. So with that, I'll bid you a good day. Thank you so much.